Bellator MMA returns to San Jose Friday, April 15th. It's a battle for the belt. When reigning champion Vadim Nemkov faces Corey Overtime Anderson for the world title and $1 million in the light heavyweight World Grand Prix final. Don't miss Nemkov versus Anderson. In a battle for light heavyweight supremacy and a whole lot of cash. Friday, April 15th at the SAP Center. For tickets, go to Ticketmaster.com. Bellator MMA returns to San Jose Friday, April 15th. Fresh off his world title victory, undefeated featherweight champion AJ Mercenary McKee takes on former three-time world champ Patricio Pitbull in an immediate must-see rematch. Don't miss McKee versus Pitbull 2, a battle between two of the best featherweights on the planet. Friday, April 15th at the SAP Center. For tickets, go to Ticketmaster.com. This is Donald Parham of the LA Chargers, and you're listening to Chargers Unleashed, part of the LA Football Network. Stay jiggy. You have to be really intentional about putting the team together. Crawl out of the pile and start screaming. How good is Joey Bosa? Rolling, looking, throwing, end zone, touchdown, intercepted. Derwin James. Derwin was there with her. You gotta be on a mission every day in the NFL. But even more than that, you gotta be on a mission together. Great hands, Keenan Allen. The Los Angeles Chargers select Rashawn Slater. Asante Samuel Jr. That was late. Ah! Oh, I'm stopping y'all boys. I'm going get it. Intercepted. Picked off by Michael Davis. Explosion. Explosiveness from Eckler. There's Murphy. Boy, he blew that up, didn't he? It is picked off. Nasir Adderley. 50-50 ball is 100%. Mike Williams. Ojenna Nuosu. And that will end it. Time to bolt up. Welcome to another episode of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and Dan Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. You can, of course, find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at LAC underscore Unleashed. If you are looking for year-round Chargers content, special guest episodes, be sure to subscribe to Chargers Unleashed on YouTube and wherever you find your podcast. This episode, of course, is being brought to you today by Brewery X, UFC Fit and Temecula, and Chargers Bolt Family. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome and thank you for checking us out. Super excited today with the NFL season currently underway and week one in the books. It is time to look forward to the Chargers next matchup. And there is possibly no other better way to do this, to look forward to the matchup between the Chargers and the Dallas Cowboys than to bring on a very special guest. And as he does so well, Dan Wolkenstein, the floor is yours, sir. Yes, we are on to week two and the Chargers versus the Dallas Cowboys matchup is up. So who better to help get us prepared for this Sunday's game than the play-by-play announcer for the Dallas Cowboys himself? Oh my goodness, here we go. He also writes for the Dallas Cowboys covering the team. You've heard his voice on college basketball championships, Super Bowls, college football, one of the greats in the business. We are fortunate enough to sit down with the voice of the Dallas Cowboys, Mr. Brad Sham, to talk about the week's matchup versus the Cowboys. Brad, welcome to Chargers Unleashed. Grateful to have you joining us. How are you? I'm well. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. Thank you for the kind words and um, delighted to be here. You're very welcome. Now, we're, I feel so lucky to be able to get to talk to you about this matchup. Uh, we talked a little bit offline. I have a ton of family who live in Texas. I've been visiting San Antonio for the holidays since I was a little kid. Tons of Cowboys fans in my life and my family. Excited for this matchup. This one feels like it has a bit of extra juice between me and some of my family. <laughs> so much we're looking forward to getting into with you. We've got the return of Dak your perspective on the 2021 season, of course, went into the matchup uh, and storylines going into the game versus the 1-0 and Chargers at SoFi Stadium. But you've covered this Cowboys team for a while now, and, and nobody okay. knows this team better than you. Coming off of a hard-fought loss to Tom Brady and the Bucks, what's kind of like the sentiment, what's the vibe like in Dallas now as the team kind of prepares to kind of turn the page, face off against the Chargers this week? You know, uh, Dan, it's funny. Um, it's one of the very few times 
that I've ever seen uh, the kind of public mood be really positive after they lost a game. Usually they're, they're um, taking out measures of rope and uh, looking, for, looking for ledges to jump off of. But they, I don't think anybody expected them. I would say I did not expect them to be ahead of Tampa Bay at home. Great atmosphere there with a minute 24 to go, especially having been down by, I think, 11 points. And then they, they were ahead. I, d- I would not say that they should have won the game, but they certainly could have. And they made a lot of mistakes throughout the game and still were uh, were able to hang in there. And I'm not sure that anybody in this part of the country really thought that they were going to do that with Tampa Bay. And so now here's their problem. Um, One thing I've learned is that from one week to the next, last week has nothing to do with this week. Mm -hmm. And um, people here... Uh, probably think the Chargers are still in San Diego. And I have been trying to tell them that this is a really difficult game. I I don't know if I was more impressed with a quarterback in the last half of last year with any other guy than I was with Justin Herbert. He's just tremendous. And um, obviously the the pedigree of their defense uh, with their coaching staff is outstanding. And the fact that they just went on the road and beat a team with a much better defense than Dallas is bringing into SoFi, that, that's all, that is all pretty daunting. And so if the Cowboys are 0-2, which would not be the end of the world, they got plenty of time, and in their division I think they can manage that. But if they are 0-2, trust me, it'll be a different vibe than it is after almost beating Tampa Bay. And that's because I think people don't understand what the Chargers are all about. Now, Brad, looking at this week's matchup, I mean, you just mentioned the differences in the defense between Washington and Dallas. I mean, you flip it over to the offensive side of the ball. The Chargers are going to have their hands full, obviously, with the return of Dak, CeeDee Lamb, Amari Cooper, Zeke. Uh, You get Zach Martin back from the COVID-19 list. The Chargers' defense has obviously improved now with a healthy Derwin James back. We know that he makes that defense a lot better. And we could dissect this so many different ways with these matchups. But with with what you've seen from both teams in week one, what are the key matchups that we should be watching between the Cowboys' defense – or excuse me, the Cowboys' offense and the Chargers' defense coming into this week? Well, actually, I was just watching the Chargers-Washington game before I jumped on the line with you guys. So – um they, they, I have to watch a little bit more of their defense, but I mean, I know they have some great players. You know, the safety's a great player. Bosa's a great player. And then if you just look at the accomplishments of the head coach when he was with the Rams and, and see how he got this job, then you understand that this is a, a team that should be, I'm talking about the Chargers defensively, should be I think taken more seriously than they should, or than they than I think they are being. Now that said, I mean the Cowboys are pretty good on offense. You know they're not going to have their right tackle, and um, <laughs> Lyle Collins got suspended for uh, some kind of a drug violation. He's going to miss five games. So the, now the the great debate in town here is: should they move Zach Martin to right tackle? which he did a couple of games last year because their line was a mess. Their tackles were down, and, I mean, it was awful. And so it got bad enough at one point. The guy who Jerry Jones went on the radio uh, this morning (laughs) when Mike McCarthy was not speaking today and apparently announced that uh, Terrence Steele would be starting at right tackle. Steele's a a, – Second-year player, a free agent from Texas Tech. Uh, He made the team last year in that bizarre year uh, as an undrafted free agent. And when Collins was injured, uh, he stepped in. I think he started 14 games last year. Now, that doesn't mean he started them and played well, but he started them. And so the dilemma that they have is that Connor McGovern, who um, played right guard for Martin uh, and who played a a good bit in his first real year of competing out of school last year, he had a pretty good game against Tampa. 
And so there are some people here. They're, you know, McCarthy's going to have to answer a lot of questions this week about why it's not better to have McGovern at guard and Martin at tackle than it is to have Martin at guard and Steele at tackle. And, of course, Steele can answer that by going out and playing well. But that's the conversation that's going to be going on here. And I think that they're going to have to figure out the best bunch to kind of try to keep the Chargers front at bay. And then we've got an interesting game because, I mean, the Cowboys are pretty good on offense. They've got some weapons, and I think Prescott's a good quarterback. And uh, that, and so it should make for a really, a really interesting game. Now, you guys can tell me um, how much support from Chargers fans they'll have. This is the kind of game I've seen from time to time that uh, Cowboy fans have managed to get their hands on some tickets. And so there there could be um, a, more than a little Cowboy support in the stands at SoFi. And that might be something that would inspire them a little bit. But I don't know. I'm just guessing on that. Oh, you're not wrong. There's definitely a huge... Cowboys contingent following that's in California, obviously with the team that when they do their training camps in Oxnard, I do not doubt at all that there will be a good showing of the Dallas Cowboy fans at SoFi this weekend. No question. Um, now let's flip it opposite here for a second. So let's, let's look at it from a Chargers offense to the Dallas defense for perspective, because obviously the Chargers have weapons of their own with Justin Herbert, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Austin Eckler. Coming off of the year that Dallas had last year defensively, they obviously made defense one of their biggest priorities in the offseason, specifically in the draft. You bring in guys like Michael Parsons, Kelvin Joseph, one of Dan and I's favorites, draft prospects, Israel Mukwamu. What have you seen from this defense, these defensive rookies so far, obviously throughout training camp? And what should Charger fans expect to see from that defense on Sunday? Why were you guys on Mukwamu? Who, who in the hell was on Mukwamu? Nobody knew about Mukwamu. <laughs> Dan, go ahead. <laughs> so we we had we actually were fortunate enough to have some guys uh, going into the draft, and one of the ones that I saw that I actually really liked because of his length was Izzy Mukwamu. So we actually had him on the show. He's a guest of ours, and after kind of watching him and kind of seeing what he's capable of in terms of his length, his speed, he kind of, at least in my opinion, and I think Jake was on board after we kind of talked about it for a while. He has that unicorn physique that I think a lot of folks in the NFL love and are praying for, and. He seemed like a versatile piece that you can bring anywhere. And so he actually had a lot of buzz within the Chargers Twitter sphere of wanting him, of us wanting him to be one of our corners potentially in like the you know fourth, fifth round. And then when you guys get him along with Micah Parsons, who I was also super high on, uh, I was just like, well, Dallas did well. Well, yeah, you know, uh, once the Twitter sphere is involved, then obviously the rest of us just have to sit back and, and uh, just do what they tell us to do. Mukwamu is an interesting guy. He was inactive last week, but he was, as you know, a corner at South Carolina. He was the other corner, and they immediately converted him to safety. Uh, Dan Quinn, who took over for Gus Bradley at Seattle and helped uh, grow the the famous Legion of Boom, he saw the he likes those long defensive backs. Uh, he he saw a little bit in. Uh, Mukwamu potentially of what some of what he had um, maybe in Cam Chancellor. I don't know if that's a little bit of a reach, but the body type was, I think, what Quinn was looking at. Um, and Mukwamu had a good summer. He made the team on merit. Um, he was inactive last week. Uh, he might be again. We'll see. They they had a safety, uh, Darian Thompson, who was a, is a key part of their special teams, even though they had him on the practice squad, he heard a hamstring last week. Um, and so now they say they're going to activate Malik Hooker, who coming out of college, as we all know, is a phenomenal player. Uh, I don't know who he is as a player right now, and I'm not sure he does. But um, I, I think that, you know, they had to be better than last year because they were so bad last year it was just almost incomprehensible they were they were statistically historically bad for their franchise i'm not criticizing them i'm just reading you the numbers they gave up more points and touchdowns than any dallas team in history 
they could not get out of their own way. They were awful. And that's why Quinn was brought in, changed out a couple of parts of the coaching staff. Players seem to have responded. There are some interesting things in examining them. And, and on defense, you know, on offense, they are, they're not an old team, but they're much more experienced. That defense is really young. So um, they have a couple, like one of their key pieces, actually, one of their key pieces is Neville Gallimore, defensive tackle, their second round pick last year. I thought he was their best interior defensive lineman uh, in camp, and he's out for, for the first few weeks with uh, an elbow dislocation. They drafted Kelvin Joseph um, in the second round when they when they couldn't get either of the two corners that they had their eye on Horn or Sertan. He's got a hamstring, and so he's out for the first part of the year. So there's pieces they're missing. Um, Randy Gregory, who I thought had a great summer, and I'm really looking forward to watching him. He's, an, he's a fascinating personal story who has made a, amazing strides uh, to put a, a, a misdirected life back together with counseling and medication and a tremendous character. He's an enormously bright guy, um, and, and, and he had a really good summer. Well, he's on the COVID list right now. Now, he's vaccinated, the, re- the report is. So he went on the list, I think, I don't know if it was Sunday or Monday. Um, and But since if, if it's correct that he's vaccinated, then he only needs consecutive. He only needs, and he, he's, he's vaccinated and asymptomatic, according ah. to reports, which is key because if you're asymptomatic, then you just need uh, consecutive negative tests in a 24-hour period and you can be activated again. So uh, tomorrow's their first day of practice. He may or may not be back for then, but you got to think he's got a decent chance to be ready to go on Sunday. So Demarcus Lawrence had a good game at the other end. Gregory's good. Parsons was a guy that I personally was very much in favor of their drafting mm-hmm. because I saw him in the Cotton Bowl two years ago and um, I looked at a lot of tape of Penn State getting ready for that game in addition to him being the defensive MVP of the game. And, I turned to my statistician who's been with me for about 30 years. I said, can we just keep him here? Does he, do we have to we let him leave town? I mean, he was he's just awesome. He's an unusual player. Uh, got some criticism on draft day because, you know, you're not supposed to draft a linebacker. And to me, he's more than just a linebacker. Hmm. Who's on the field could be partly determined by who the Chargers have on the field offensively. And then if the coaching staff wants to try to mix things up, I, I, Parsons was um, around the ball. He was not super active last week. I think he's got a chance to be a special player, but he's just learning. He's just got to figure out how to, how to play. Everybody, everybody in, in LA knows what Herbert is or they should. I mean, he, I just think the world of him and he's super accurate and he's got a cannon and those receivers and Jake, you mentioned them before Williams and Allen, especially, um, man, those guys are really good, really good. We've seen them before. It's been a while. Obviously one of the interesting things about a game like this is the teams only play every four years, but those are, those are really, really good players. And the Cowboys secondary is average. Now, now Diggs, the right corner who was their second pick last year, he's got a chance to be special. Um, but the safeties have got to prove it. All the rest of them have to prove it. They've got some talent, but I, the the mantra among uh, Dallas fandom was: with that offense, all they have to do is be average, just not the worst. You know, I, I don't know how much you win if you aspire to be average. You just have to be really good that day. You have to be better than the other offense that day. Uh, they got four takeaways last week. It's a hard thing to it's a, yes, it is. It's a hard thing to reconcile to yourself when you run twelve more plays than the other team and win the takeaway battle four to one and lose the game. And the time of possession too, but I don't pay much attention to that because it, it's what you do with it at the end of the possession. But um, those are statistics usually that'll win you the game, and it didn't. So I, I think that. The, the, I, I think a lot of the Chargers players on offense. Here's another interesting thing. 
you know, the big debate once Sertan and Horn were gone, uh, and and they had Micah Parsons rated ahead of both of them, but not a lot. And if either one of those players had been on the board, they'd have taken the corner because they were desperate for a corner. Mm-hmm. But uh, but they they weren't, and they knew what Parsons was. So the big de- the big debate in the draft room and in town was when it came to that twelfth pick, Parsons or Slater. Chargers well, fans are so grateful. Hey, I, they, I don't <laughs> think I don't think either team could have gone wrong. The fact that Slater had the game that he had is not a surprise. It may be a surprise to some people because he's a rookie and because he was facing an outstanding defensive front. But there, that's not a secret or a surprise that that young man's an, an exceptional player. And so there's going to be a lot of attention paid to that, especially if, if, they, if they put Parsons over him, which from time to time they might try to do. They'll line him up on the edge. Um, that's, I mean, like I said, I don't think you, either team could have gone wrong with either guy. And I think they're both going to be happy with the players they got. But um, but it's just an interesting little side wrinkle to the uh, game story. Let's take a minute and talk about Dak Prescott. After everything that he has been through over this past year, you have to have nothing but the utmost respect for his skill set, his resiliency, again, for everything that he's had to deal with. And then getting back to training camp and dealing with, you know, the lat injury and not being able to practice. You could just tell how much he was chomping at the bit to get back onto the field. As you had mentioned at the you know beginning of the show, to see him come back that way after spending so much time not practicing, you know, rehabbing everything that he did to come out with a performance like that against the Super Bowl champions. What was it like for you to witness that just to see him go out and ball again, ball out against Tampa Bay and in the inter- inner circles of the Dallas media? Because obviously Dan and I don't know, but how much does Dak just truly mean to the city and to this team? He's a really unusual young man, Jake, uh, and and what it meant to me to answer your question to watch him do that. It wasn't a big surprise, but it was really um, heartwarming. I I haven't seen every Cowboys season. I've only been doing this job forty three years. Um, <laughs> I I saw the I had the end of Staubach's career. Uh, I had all of Aikman's. I did not. Uh, get to see Don Meredith play. I, I think that as a leader and a competitor, uh, Dak Prescott is the equal of any quarterback they've ever had. Now, he's not the quarterback that those other guys were yet. You have to win. We're talking to Brad Sham, the voice of the Dallas Cowboys ahead of the Week 2 matchup versus the Los Angeles Chargers. Let's get into a couple matchups that I think everyone is chomping at the bit to see. Uh, we now are fortunate enough to have two former Offensive Rookie of the Year winners square off on Sunday. We've got Justin Herbert, Dak Prescott. Both quarterbacks, I think, were slept on a little bit prior to them both being drafted. And both, as you have mentioned, are seemingly absolute studs. What are folks in the media or folks there in Dallas, the fans, thinking or talking about Justin Herbert ahead of this game? Dan, they don't know who he is. <laughs> These people, I love it. They, they, you know, these people here, they they can't see past the end of their nose. <laughs> you know, Brady, they Brady, they know. Um, you know, they know who quarterbacks that they, they know that hurts quarterbacks the Eagles, and uh, they don't think much of Daniel Jones, and they're not sure. Of course, nobody is who's quarterbacking Washington, and uh, and and that's all they know. I mean, they know that Stafford went from the Lions to the Rams. They don't know about Justin Herbert. I'm afraid they're going to find out. Um, he's 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 a really good player, Justin Herbert. These the fans here now. The team knows who he is. Don't worry about that. The coaches, Dan Quinn, knows who he is. The, the <laughs> coaching staff, they know plenty about him, and uh, they have the kind of respect that I think everybody ought to have for him. Fans don't know anything about Justin Herbert. But they will. I will say it was fun. One of the things that Jake and I got to talk about during the week one review of the game against the Washington football team was getting to see kind of the respect from the Washington football team fans post game. 
they, most were very polite, but talking about how good Justin Herbert looked and how much they were not expecting that. I think both Jake yeah. and I were both like, well, this is, we see it every week. But let, folks let, me, outside, let, me, let me go back to what I said at the very beginning when we started. I thought he was as good a quarterback as I saw in the league the second half, certainly the last quarter of last year. You, you know, every opportunity I got to see the Chargers play, you'd watch him and you'd go, holy moly, look at this guy. And he's, he's serious business. Oh, it's it's a breath of fresh air for all Chargers fans, especially considering how last year started with that week one with Tyrod Taylor, the Pierce Long, and all of a sudden, like, here we are. Um, okay, another one. You mentioned Here's it. my question for you. Does anybody there remember Philip Rivers? <laughs> <laughs> they, they remember him, but I have a feeling they may just – put him to memory very very quick well you know here's the thing i mean did he did he play there a year <laughs> no seriously i mean he was his his career was in san diego right yeah mm -hmm. yeah he played what was it dan when they when they I relocated what was years. it yeah he played about three, three years, years in la so they knew who he was and but he, he left with a the, respect he wasn't the la chargers quarterback he was san no, no, diego's yeah. quarterback yeah, and technically, yeah, because he spent a majority of his career. Yes. Yeah, so Herbert for for Los Angeles Chargers fans, Herbert is their quarterback. Yes. Yep. Yep. And um one of the, the matchups that we got to see last week uh was a one Joey Bosa going up against a rookie in Samuel Cosme, and we saw who won that one. Terrence Steele, you mentioned it, Jerry Jones mentioned it, is gonna be starting at right tackle. How does the, the offensive line look going into week two against the Chargers defensive front. I mean, you got Joey Bosa, you got Chenna Nuosu, Kaiser White, Jerry Tillery, Linval Joseph, Kyle Fackrell. There's a ton of guys that this defense is probably going to bring in from a multiple viewpoint. I mean, you're going to see all kinds of fronts. How's the offensive line looking for you guys? Well, I mean, I think that, look, uh, Collins had a good game and he's a good player. And so losing him is not, a, is not good. Um, and much as I hate the idea, of, I think Zach Martin's a Hall of Famer. And uh, as, as much as I hate the idea of moving him outside, they know they're going to be fine. It's not like an injury where you you don't know if it's a week or two. Collins is suspended for five weeks. Uh, they, I mean, they were like a kite flapping in the wind in the offensive line last year until they moved Martin out to tackle. And then it was like, okay, we're, we may not be good, but we can compete. And McGovern is a way better player than he has been in his career. And he was a good player at Penn State. So, you know, they have they have um, made a lot of money by not asking me what I think. <laughs> but I, I would be, and I absolutely hate the idea of moving a, a great player. I, I think that there is something to the argument that if you move a player – you create uncertainty at two positions. But I, I don't think that Zach Martin is uncertain wherever you put him. And um, I, I, I'm, uh, um, I'd like to see Terrence Steele come out of the game, you know, kind of in, intact uh, <laughs> emotionally. Uh, they, they think he's a lot better than he was last year. They think he's a lot – in fact, he was one of their offseason – award winners for what he did in the strength room, the conditioning room. I, I, I Look, I'm not a coach or a scout. I don't know in preseason if I saw a tremendous improvement, but um, you, know, you have to presume they know what they're doing. I, I'm still not convinced that Steele is going to be what they're going to wind up doing. Uh, Tyron Smith's a, a, a potential Hall of Famer. He's a really, really good player, and that's a, that's a terrific matchup. You know, Connor Williams is smart, the left guard. Um, the knock on him, I think this is his fourth year, is that he was a little light. And his first year or two, he could get really shoved around. He's learned a little bit more about leverage. He's a little stronger. I don't think anybody's going to confuse him with Larry Allen. But he's uh, he's a competent player. Uh, Biotish is, a, is a, a young guy who, you know, because he went to Wisconsin and Travis Frederick went to Wisconsin, everybody wants to compare him to Frederick. He's not Frederick. Uh, 
but I think he's got a chance to be a pretty good player. Um, but he'll he also can get manhandled a little bit. So those other guys that you mentioned in the defensive line for the Chargers, you know, Linval Joseph's a veteran. They've seen him with a couple different teams. And Fackrell, if I'm not mistaken, was with Green Bay and the Giants. Yep. And he is an outstanding pass rusher. I know he's had some critical sacks against uh, this team in the last few years. And they will know how to use him. Um, Zeke Elliott's a really good pass protector. And there are going to be times that he's going to have to do that. The, their offensive line, if they had Collins at right tackle, uh, that would be an interesting battle to watch if Bosa lined up over him a good part of the day. Um, that would be fun to watch. That would be one where you could go and just say, tell me what's going on with the ball because I'm going to watch these guys. <laughs> and that would be fun. Uh, but that's not going to happen. So they've got to figure out a way to account for that. and. Um, the re- I think the the rest of the offensive line's competent, uh, but but they they're gonna they're gonna have their hands full. We saw. I think Char- Chargers fans know this all too well about all poor, too well poor special teams play. We got to talk about it. Oh. Uh, the Chargers special teams last year. You mentioned how historically bad the Cowboys were on defense. Chargers special teams last year was historically bad. I and think they created saw- a new category of how. <laughs> bad they were what, bad? Made bad. what were they bad at um oh literally God. everything they missed nine kicks more than any other team in football uh they had three block punts when i think 22 teams had none um they were giving up returns they, it, they couldn't get touchbacks it, it was bad the, they were bad at pretty much everything um and they, and you saw that this year with his coaching staff they put so much emphasis and you heard a lot of the beat writers and folks who were at training camp Nobody has seen as much emphasis on special teams during training camp as we saw with the Chargers. Now, flip that around. We saw Greg Zerline struggle a little bit for you guys on in week one. We heard that he had some surgeries and things were kind of going wrong. And now there's some guys bringing back from the practice squad. Like, how are you feeling about special teams? That's been a big emphasis for the Chargers. That was one of our Achilles heels. How do you see the matchups on special teams? Today... I don't feel good about the special teams. I thought it was a a really significant part of the reason they lost the game. Zerline, he missed a 60-yarder, but that's that's a Hail Mary. That doesn't even count. Uh, But he missed a 31-yarder, and he missed an extra point. So there's four points, and they lost by two. Um, Because John Fossil thought, and he spoke about this yesterday. This is not me saying it. This is what he said himself. He decided that it would be a good idea to try to make Tampa Bay return the kickoffs. So he they kicked them short. And the first one, they stopped them at the 20, and the next two were run out 40 yards. Mm. And um, let me just suggest, I, I, I'm not the smartest guy, but I don't think giving Tom Brady half a field is a real good idea. <laughs> so they did that twice with poor kickoff coverage. Uh, I think Anger, who is their new punter, who was with, he's been with two or three other teams. He had a really good summer, Ryan Anger, but I think he shanked one. So now, and then what really kind of made me scratch my head was when I listened to Fossil talk about it. And he said, yeah, you know, you just have to remember that the guys who are on our special teams now, they never were on the field together at the same time in any preseason game. Now, John Fossil's a really good special team, really good. And I get, and, and the Cowboys had four games, not three. Uh, and I get that in, in preseason, um, you don't want to get your starters hurt, and you have to put guys on special teams who are contending to make the team because that's how you're going to find out if they can help you on teams. You mean the guys that you thought were going to be your special teamers, you couldn't have have got them out there a game, a half game, you know, a few kickoffs, a couple of punts. Um, We saw saw that all the time, 
Uh, and again, again, John Fossil's <laughs> forgotten more about special teams play than I will ever know. But that was that was a head scratcher. And so, you know, last, as you guys well know, especially in his time with the Rams, probably was also true when he was with the Raiders. You know, one of Fossil's specialties is trick plays. And uh, one of, for Dallas fans, one of the hallmarks of last season was their home game against Washington late in the year. might have even been Thanksgiving. And um, they, they were still in the NFC East race because all of those teams were awful last year. And they were in the race. They were like, if you win, if you win like two games in December, you're going to win the division at seven and nine. Nice. So they've got a uh, fourth down and twenty something at their own twenty. Let me just say that again. <laughs> fourth down and twenty something at their own twenty. And they were trailing by, I think, four points. Uh, they ran a fake punt from their own 20 in the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. And it lost yardage. Oh, and, no. and, uh, and, and they'd, they'd had like two or three other fake punts that during the year that they tried that didn't work. Um, and that has some folks going, <laughs> now I, I'm going to say again John Fossil is one of the best special teams coaches in the world he's aggressive he's creative his players love him that was true when he was with the Rams it was true when he was with the Raiders it's true now I don't feel like they've got a special teams edge coming into this game and I don't know anything about the Chargers special teams yet Okay, that just, says something. But I, but I'm, just, I'm just telling you that special teams is one of the reasons they lost last week. Kickoff coverage, missed field goals, one bad punt. You can't have it when you're playing the world champions on their field to open the season. You have to be perfect in those areas to have a chance to win. And and their special teams did not help them last week. And so – there's a let's just let's be optimistic. Let's look at glass, glass half full. They've got a great opportunity to improve in that department this week. <laughs> let's talk about one of the bigger matchups going into this game because you talk about the, the game that Dallas had, especially the wide receivers, two wide receivers specifically against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers that went over 100 yards CD Lamb and Amari Cooper. Amari Cooper had a game that reminded everybody why the Dallas Cowboys traded a first round pick for him because mm. he went berserk against this team, uh, against the Buccaneers specifically. We know Michael Gallup is is out this week with an injury. Cedric Wilson is going to step in in his place, going to be the wide receiver three. But you just see what Dak was able to, you know, cr- what type of offense he was able to create with these weapons. I mean, it's going to be a huge task for this Chargers secondary coming to, to, into this week's game. So what should we expect to see, like, the biggest matchups? Obviously, Dallas is going to look to exploit some things. Chargers are going to look to try to stop certain aspects. But from your view, Brad, what do, what do you take away from this? Well, I mean, I think the, the, the fun thing from a fan's, a spectator's point of view Jay is that they've got some weapons. Cooper's one of the best route runners in the league. And uh, I'm not sure that wasn't his very best game in a Dallas uniform. Mm-hmm. Um, on the road, tough crowd. And uh, he, you know, he had a, rep- a reputation of being a guy who would drop one on you when he was uh, with the Raiders. But he, that has not been a problem for him. Um, and he's good. Lamb is a phenomenal athlete. He's a freak show as an athlete um, to take the next step, he does, he will drop one for you every now and then. And he dropped one or two last week and that can't happen to take the next step. But I I don't want to sound like I'm being critical of CD lamb. He's an exceptional player and uh, they're really lucky to have the two of them. And without Gallup, uh, that's a dimension, but Cedric Wilson's a nice player, smart player. And he's got Prescott's, um, confidence. Uh, he's he. We've seen him make big plays. 
they've got a couple of tight ends who can catch the ball pretty well. Um, they've got a couple of running backs who are pretty good in the passing game. So I, I think that the things to watch are those. I think it depends on, you know, Dak will go to the line of scrim. Like the people the other day uh, were complaining that Elliott didn't have enough runs, which is this is great. I don't know how NFL coaches ever make a mistake with all the help they've got in that Twitter sphere that you already <laughs> invoked. Right? If they, you know, if they, if they if run him 20 times, then why are you not throwing to Cooper and Lamb? And then they ran him like four times and well, you're not running. Oh, please. Um, and uh, Kellen Moore said on Monday that they had um, 28 runs called that Dak changed 12 of to passes because of what he saw because of the look. So that's what fans don't understand. The quarterback has like four or five options on every play, and he's going to look at the defense and decide what makes the most sense to him. Almost all of these guys, uh, maybe not a brand new rookie, but most of these guys have the freedom to change things based on the look they get. So the answer to your question is what to expect. It depends on what looks the Chargers give them. And who they throw the ball to and how often they run and which of the two running backs they run it with. Um, that'll depend a lot on what the Chargers give them and what Prescott decides to do with it. Well, let's talk about how much the Cowboys are going to run because you, you brought it up, obviously, Ezekiel Elliott, only 11 carries, 33 yards, definitely not one of his best games. I expect that to change in a hurry. Again, this upcoming Sunday, I think he will have a much better game against the Chargers interior defensive line, which I still believe is one of the biggest Achilles heels for this team. You have big guys in the middle like Linval Joseph, Justin Jones, Jerry Tillery still coming into his own. People are still waiting for him to eventually come into the what they're to expect of a first round pick. But, you know, I, I'm with you. The, the tempo of the game, the way that it was going, it running the ball wasn't really working for Dallas, especially going up against that run defense. But again, I expect that to change this week, and I think it's going to free up a lot of opportunities for Dak. So Zeke Elliott going up against this interior defensive line of the Chargers, I would assume that you would also agree, Brad, that it's going to be a, it could be a bounce back game for Zeke. So here's the thing. I, I don't, I don't think Zeke had a bad game. He didn't have a productive statistical running game, but Thank you. Uh, he was he he's a he is a running back. He plays the running back position, and that includes blocking, and it includes receiving, and it includes clearing out. And he's really good at that stuff. He's one of the best blockers in the backfield for a really outstanding runner that I've ever seen. And if you look at some of the things that he did in the passing game, I would then challenge you to say that he didn't have a good game. He didn't have a statistical rushing game that is anything that he wants to send a, a home and frame. But um, look, they want to run. Uh, the idea is for most teams, you you want to if you can run, then you can throw when you want to. Some of it depends on how the game goes. You can ha you can intend to be. Um, 45% run. And if you turn the ball over, you give up a couple of touchdowns and you're chasing the score, then the whole game plan is standing on its head and everything changes. <laughs> so the game dictates some of that. You absolutely want to run. I think he's an outstanding runner and he definitely wants to run, whether it's up the middle or bouncing it outside or, but uh, Kellen Moore made an interesting point, And that is that what he's interested <laughs> When he's looking for his yards, he doesn't care how they get them. They had a play. They had a, a little uh, jet sweep to Pollard that, that gained some nice yardage. So in the, in the NFL, when the receiver comes around on the, on the reverse on the jet sweep and the quarterback tosses it to him two feet, that's a pass. And then he goes running. And uh, it doesn't. That's that was Kellen Moore's point. I don't care how I don't care if we run it or throw it. We want yards. 
we're going to do what we can do to get yards. And if you can't run, then you throw. And if you can run, then you run and throw. Um, so he, I mean, they need for Elliot to rush for more than 30 yards a game for sure. I think ideally what you want to do is be the kind of team that can be ahead by a couple scores and then you run a lot at the end and you wear the other team down. Now this is a different game. The rules are different than 30 years ago. 30 years ago, I mean the pass the pass defense rules are different. The uh formations that people run out of are different. They weren't doing the same things in the 90s. But in the 90s, the Cowboys had a lot of close games. And if they were um, ahead with five minutes to go, then you weren't going to win because you weren't going to get the ball anymore because they were going to grind you down and they were going to give the ball to Emmett Smith and he was going to run for about five minutes. And that would be the end of the game. But you don't, that's not how football, you can't. That's not how football is played now. So, you know, would would, would they like Elliott to have more than 30 yards rushing? Yes, absolutely. It's going to depend on how the Chargers play and how what the flow of the game is. Brad, I feel like I'm going to go listen to this probably three or four times and just take notes on all of the the nuggets that you've given us. And, and, And by the way, Thank you so much for doing this again. Um, yeah, you're welcome. I, I think it's, it's interesting. I don't think fans in LA or Southern California or just Chargers fans in general understand. Like, you got to call Super Bowls, like, with your home team, and they won. Like, you're kind of the one of the best of the best. And so mm-hmm. your perspective, I think, is um, something that I'm probably going to cherish for a long time. So, okay, look, all of this being kind of taken into account, Put on your wizard hat for a sec. Here it comes. How do you see this game going? Like, what's your what's your feel, Dan? You can you can go you can ask me sixteen different ways if you want. And I I am just starting to watch the Chargers. <laughs> uh, I uh, and then and then for most of the next two days I will be atoning for my sins. So <laughs> I, I I won't have any clue until I have watched some more of the chargers and uh and have a little better handle on it what they did with washington um last week but i think it's going to be a game right now i think it's a game that either team could win i i think it's i think they're both pretty good teams i think the chargers are underappreciated and undervalued and um my hope from my perspective is that the cowboys are not among the people who are doing that. Because if they are, they're going to be in for a long day Sunday afternoon. Now, have you have you had a chance to go to SoFi Stadium yet? No, because last year, you know, COVID. And they True. opened with the Rams. And we were doing the games from here. So I'm very excited to see it. I hear just all the greatest things. And, you know, um, that Jerry Jones was instrumental in that stadium uh, being built on mm-hmm. that site, on the Rams going where they went, and uh, he he had a lot to do with that. So he's very proud of it, and he should be. And it's going to be the Western capital of the NFL for a very long time. And some of the people who were involved in building AT and T Stadium were involved in designing SoFi. And I've I have heard that it is a technological wizard. In Los Angeles, California, what else would you expect? I'm excited to see it. Yeah, I'm excited. This is the first time, obviously, for fans too going in for a regular season game. I will be there at the game on Sunday. I'll wave to you in the press box when I see you, if I see you. Um, Brad Sham, thank you so much for coming on the yeah. show. For folks who do not know to follow for all things Dallas Cowboys or just Texas sports in general, you can find him on Twitter at boys underscore Vox, V-O-X. Brad, thank you so much for joining us on Chargers Unleashed. It's been a pleasure. Good luck to you and the team on Sunday. And best of luck the rest of the year, all right? Thank you. You don't mean that part about good luck Sunday, but it's okay. It was a polite good luck thing. Good luck another week except this thank, one. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Have a good week. Thank you. Bye-bye.
know a spot, but not just a spot, the spot. Actually, with the all-new Nissan Frontier, you know a bunch of them. One for hitting the trail. One for catching a wave. One where this happened. Yo, where'd our tent go? Another where the fish get bigger. Every time you tell the story. Some spots, you made your mark. Others, marked you. And one, oh, okay, let's stay away from that one. But the key to these great spots, being able to reach them in the first place. Your spot is out there. Find your frontier in the all-new 2022 Nissan Frontier. With best-in-class standard 310 horsepower, advanced tech, and 281 pound-foot of torque. Comparison based on 2022 Frontier S versus latest in-market Ward small truck segment. Base models compared based on manufacturer's website. Spring it on with 40 to 70% off almost everything at Gap Factory and GapFactory.com. Matching styles for the family are on sale too. Shop it all through April 12th. 